everyone, and welcome back to our third session, our 8.30 to 9 a.m. session of the 2017 Open Simulator Community Conference. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. And you can tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag of hashtag OSCC17. So this session is entitled Open Simulator Statistics, and we'll give people an idea about how Open Simulator is used. Our speaker today is Maria Karolov, and she is an editor and publisher of Hypergrid Business. She has been a war correspondent, she's run a news bureau in Shanghai, and covered business and technology for national magazines for more than 15 years. But the emerging metaverse is the most exciting thing she's ever covered, she says. So welcome, Maria, and to everybody here. And I'm going to turn the mic over to you, Maria. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I hope everyone can hear me OK. OK, I'm going to assume that's a yes. So, um, uh, so I do a couple of surveys every year about for OpenSIM users and um, OpenSIM hosting providers and the grids they use. And I'm going to be presenting those statistics today. And the numbers are for Hypergood Business, which is at hypergoodbusiness.com, which is the publication I have been editing since 2008, I believe. I mean, this is like a, a nine years now, and this has been an enormous length of time. And every month we do a roundup of data, and then every year we do some surveys. And we've got, I've got something like 3,000 articles that have been published on here from over 100 different contributors. So this has been, uh, we've, it's been, it's been a lot of work and it's been a lot of fun over these past few years. Um, th this has been, I mean, I love the fact that there's an open source immersive environment available and that anybody can start up and run their own virtual world. So, so, so that's who I am, and my um, my email address is up there, and it's also going to be on the last slide as well. If anybody wants to contact me with questions or story ideas, or if you want to write for us or contribute press releases, we run free ads for all open sim grids and projects and merchants and anybody else who wants one. So contact me for any of that. So uh, the big thing um, for me this year, and also the last couple of years, is that the hypergrid has won. The interconnected metaverse on the OpenSIM platform has really dominated the public grids. Back at the beginning, there was a bit of a split. There were some private closed grids where you had to create a new avatar on just that grid. And if you wanted to go to a different grid, you had to log out and go to the other grid, create a new avatar, log in, and it was a pretty cumbersome process. Today, for the most part, the land is heavily dominated by the hypergrid. Um, almost all the regions in OpenSIM public grids are hypergrid enabled, and almost all the active users are hypergrid uh, on the hypergrid enabled grids as well. Now, to, to some degree, those um, numbers are a little skewed because in worlds stopped recording their stats this year, and they had about 5,000 users last we checked. So um, if their numbers were added in, the red line of the closed grids would be a little bit higher for active users, not much higher for land because they're not a big grid land area wise. Um, but you wouldn't really see a substantial difference even when those users are counted in. It's, it's really dramatic. Um, grids have been switching over from the closed system to the open hypergrid enabled system for the past few years. A lot of it is due to the fact that people have figured out how to sell content in OpenSIM and grid owners have started cracking down on content. Uh, it used to be that it was a default. Uh, it was assumed that everywhere you go, you would get freebie shops full of stuff of questionable provenance. Today, when that happens, it's a scandal. So that's a, a big difference from, well, yeah, what can you do? You know, there isn't really any legitimate content. All you have is the stolen stuff 
to the point today, which is we have so much legitimate content. It's widely available. There's so many creators. There's no reason to have stolen stuff. And the people who do have stolen stuff, we're going to shut those, those stores down. We're going to shut those regions down. And um, that's been a significant amount of progress that I have really, really appreciate seeing because I'm kind of in favor of business and, you know, legality and making it a comfortable environment for merchants and creators and so on. So, um, uh, so for the land area, uh, it has been growing steadily. There's been occasional drops, uh, as you can see up there, when a grid has shut down or a grid has launched um, a wide open area. So open areas are something that's unique to OpenSim. In Second Life, every region is going to cost you 300 bucks. You're not going to have a lot of free open areas just for sailing or flying around in or space battles or, or desert treks. You can't afford that kind of open space. In OpenSim, you can. You can have a lot of space just for general stuff and general travel, exploring, battles, and you don't have to pay a lot for it. And in fact, with variable regions, you can pay less and less every day. So that's a, that's a, for me, that's a benefit of OpenSim. Now, that does translate into lower um, uh, average usage rates per region. But that's not really a meaningful comparison because, you know, if you were to let, randomly land someplace on Earth, it would probably be empty too. Um, you want to go where people are doing stuff. And uh, the fact that those people aren't evenly distributed isn't so much of an issue as is the fact that when people do uh, get together somewhere, you can find them. And we now have lots of ways for people to find things. We have open sim worlds. We've got several different Google Plus groups and Facebook groups where the events are posted and promoted. We do a regular monthly roundup of events at Hyper Good Business. Uh, plus, there's the Hyperica directory, which I sold um, this uh, early this year to Fred Beckinson, and he's been doing a great job with that and his new Outworlds Open Sim installer for people to set up their own easy grids. So the, the discovery has become a lot easier for OpenSim. So you can find those events that are going on. You're not randomly teleporting from empty region to empty region. So that's, that, that is a very nice uh, feature that we have in OpenSim. We do not yet currently have a search uh, that works, like a Google of OpenSim. And that would be kind of nice to see. Um, so maybe somebody is going to be working on it. Um, so I mentioned um, a little earlier today about, a little a few minutes ago, about uh, the content uh, situation in OpenSim. And the biggest, the biggest progress that we've made over the past couple of years has been the Kitely market. And there's going to be more talk about it on the commerce panel. But basically, we're talking about 20,000 different items available that can be delivered to over 228 different grids. Any grid can accept Kitely Market content deliveries, whether it's an open grid or a closed grid or some other different kind of grid. There, there's, a, there's a setting you can enable, and, and all of your users can now shop on the Kitely Market, which is a website, and have the deliveries delivered straight to their avatars. And you know, they just show, show up you know, as, as a little in-world message, and, and they accept the content, and they have it in their inventory. Excellent system works really, really well. And as you can see from the blue lines of this chart, pretty much all the growth on the Kitely market over the past few years has been on the exportable content, content that can go out to those 228 different grids, as opposed to content that is limited to just the Kitely grid and is not exportable. Merchants are getting used to the idea that people who are going to steal content aren't their customers anyway, and that the people who want to buy content want to have an easy, convenient way to buy it. So that selling on a hypergrid is basically all upside and not that much downside. So um, we're, we're seeing that uh, expand continuously. It's been growing steadily over the past few years. Um, and um, I assume it's going to continue to do so. 
And um, the other thing that's helped with the cross-grid commerce is the Globit uh, payment system. And this is a common currency that you can use on many different grids. And that has been growing this year as well. So um, that, is a, that is a nice uh, little thing. Um, and uh, we also ask people about, uh, you know, do they travel to other grids? And in our most recent survey, which we did in October, the average person has been to five different grids. Now, they probably don't remember all the grids they've been on, and they might not even notice that they're on a different grid because you can go through a teleport gate and end up on a different gate, grid, and you might not even know that you traveled from your home grid somewhere else as opposed to being in a different region on the same grid. So those numbers are probably undercounts. So, yeah, so um, OpenSIM people are traveling around, and... Uh, and that's been continuing to go up. So um, we also asked people about what grids they visited the most. And OS Grid remains kind of the, the crossing meeting place, the crossroads of the metaverse. Um, more than 70% of people have been to OS Grid. And um, o OS Grid is the, is the biggest grid by land area, uh, it's usually the biggest by users. It's got um, a system where anybody can connect the regions that they run on their home computers. So it's um, a lot of people are connecting home-based regions to it. There are outside vendors that will run regions for you and connect them to OS Grid. And OS Grid is the primary platform for testing you know, new features at scale. If it works on OS Grid, it's going to work anywhere. So they're a nonprofit, they're a registered nonprofit, you can donate money to them. And I recommend that people do that. If you want to support the growth of OpenSIM, it's right now the best place to donate if you want to support, support this. And um, it's tax deductible. So go to their website, osgrid.org, and click on the donate button. Uh, especially donate a regular monthly schedule so they ha they know they have money coming in to pay for servers and hosting and you know all the other stuff that they have to pay for so a uh, great uh, great grid I strongly recommend that you take a look at them um, we also ask people how much they like their grids and despite all, all the complaints you might hear um, People pretty much love the OpenSIM grids they're on. Only 2% of our readers say they wouldn't recommend their grid to others. Um, so, uh, yes, those are the 2% that you hear, you know, speaking up. But um, they're a very, very tiny minority. Uh, people really do enjoy being here. But they would like to see some uh, more features added to OpenSIM. So there was a developer panel earlier today. And um, the number one thing that came out of the developer panel was that we need a new viewer for OpenSIM that's specific for OpenSIM, that's not tied to Second Life, so we can start having some you know, better features, better graphics. That's also the top concern for our readers. Um, the people who uh, took the hosting survey last week said that this is the most important thing they want is the web-based viewer. And then an online marketplace and content was in second place. Um, this may be because people aren't aware of the Kitely market or they think that, you know, Kitely market still doesn't have enough stuff on it. So um, now the, the thing that I'm uh, most concerned about, and I don't have a slide up for it, is, um, it, is the position of OpenSIM with regard to the virtual reality community. Uh, virtual reality has been taking off. Uh, millions of um, PlayStation 2 headsets are being sold. Uh, over 100 million of the mobile-based headsets uh, have been sold. Um, the YouTube 360-degree apps are like very widely uh, watched by millions of people. Uh, lots of investment going on in this category. A lot of hype around it. And right now, it seems to be completely bypassing OpenSAM because we're not architected to work well in virtual reality. There's a viewer, the Control-Alt-Studio viewer, that kind of helps OpenSAM be used in the Oculus Rift and other um, VR viewers, but it's not really optimized for VR. On the, if, you, if you're experiencing OpenSAM on a desktop and you have some lag, 
it's annoying. You know, you might go grumble a little bit. If you're wearing a headset and you experience lag, you're going to start getting nauseous. You might throw up. It is a very, very significant issue for virtual reality that you have very stable frame rates and that the, the vision, that the of, of video quality is very, very consistent and reliable. And OpenSim is not architected around that. The OpenSim viewers aren't architected around that. It would require a significant amount of work to redesign it, to do that. Second Life gave up on doing it. Linden Lab uh, uh, abandoned their virtual reality viewer for Second Life and switched to focusing on Sansar instead, which is built from scratch. So that's, uh, that's a big question that OpenSim is going to have. Are we going to remain a niche product for people who want to have desktop-based virtual worlds? Is it ex going to expand to having a web-based viewer to kind of expand the audience a little bit more? Or is it going to expand even further to include virtual reality support? And all the projects that I've heard of that have been ongoing have kind of faded away. The U.S. Army had a big one, but Maxwell Adams, the guy who was heading it, has moved on to something else, and I haven't heard anything out of them since. Um, so I'm um, very, very concerned about um, which way this is going. And I hope that next year we're going to see, um, you know, see some changes in this and see some progress. So um, I've posted a link to these slides um, below. And um, it's also up here, um, OSCC17 um, hyphen hyperglid at bit.ly.com. And there's my contact information again. Sorry, uh, yes, I misspoke. Douglas Maxwell instead of Maxwell Adams. Uh, thank you, Son, for pointing that out. Um, uh, so, um, we have a few minutes for questions uh, before they go on to the next session, which um, uh, uh, and there's going to be a viewer development session in uh, three hours from now too, that I suggest that people um, uh, people attend because that's going to be very vital for the future development of OpenSim. Um, Meg, are there any questions? All right, um, I'm going to, I'm taking a look at the in-world comments. Um, Hi, Maria. And, hey, we Maggie. don't have any questions yet, uh, but I did want to ask you, from covering all these grids, um, mm -hmm. what is your insight into um, if, if the viewer did get updated, mm -hmm. you know, how many things is that going to affect? Well, first of all, if there's a web-based viewer that you can embed on a website or share on Facebook, that will and that has like guest avatars, so you can just click and enter into it without having to download a viewer, install it, configure it, hook it up, get the grid URI set up. I, I don't really I know if people realize this because we've been in OpenSim for a while, but getting into OpenSim for the first time is actually really, really difficult. And yeah. and we do this every day, so we don't notice it. But for, for you can't just click on a link and there you are, like you can with everything else. You have to figure out which viewer you're going to use. You're going to have to figure out which grid you want to log into. And then you have to log, go to the grid's website, create an account, and create an avatar. If we can make this process one click and you're in, that is going to expand the marketing, the social networking available for grid owners immensely. I mean, we're talking a big, dramatic, dramatic change. And I think this is why so many grid owners in my survey last uh, this past week said that having a web viewer was their number one priority. Right. Okay. So, um, uh, Christer Lindstrom, he says, we've developed software to do a conversion from the region to Unity. Mm -hmm. So, 
can we get the VR to AR? Okay, so you can convert OpenSim regions um, to to full mesh, and there's companies out there that'll do it for you, and there's software that'll do it for you, and then you can set it up as a Unity project, and or a Web VR project, or WebGL project, or and there's other platforms. Uh, s s Science Spaces has a, has a web-based VR platform, but this is all exporting out of OpenSim and importing into another platform that has a web viewer or that has virtual reality. So you'd have to actually leave OpenSim, export the content out of it, go somewhere else, load up the content, content that was created with the idea of using it in OpenSim, not using it in this other platform. And then people can walk around it with you know, a VR viewer. Um, so that's, that's taking people outside of OpenSim um, that's basically using OpenSim as a development platform, and there's other better development tools out there for VR content. Um, so I haven't really seen a lot of uptake on that. Mm -hmm. um, definitely if a company or a school wants to move their entire campus over to Unity, they can do this. But for like a small you know, event organizer or something, it, this is one, one of those, it's, it's a pretty much a one-way trip. You're saying, okay, I'm going to leave OpenSim and I'm go, going to go over to Alt Space VR, or I'm going to go over to Science Space, or I'm going to go over to Sansar, or some other platform that does web viewer, that does virtual reality, and I'm going to be over there now. That's that's a migration. That's you're you're an immigrant immigrant out of yeah. OpenSim. Gotcha. Um, DJ Phil is asking: Did Mose uh, abandon the web-based viewer project? Do you know. I have not been able to get anything out of them. I've emailed them. I've emailed the new people have taken over. I haven't been able to get a yes or no on this. If anybody, if anybody has heard of anything, um, it, please let me know. The open source code is still out there. It's called Halcyon. Anybody can use it if they want to and contribute to it. Um, and it's, it's available on GitHub. Somebody just posted a link um, in world. Um, so but it's, it's designed right now for closed government and corporate and school grids where you don't need people to teleport in and out. You don't need people to, you know, maybe, maybe get content from the Kitely market. It's, it's a very small, controlled, um, very secure space, um, and it, which is useful for many projects. Like I said, for an elementary school, for example, or a government agency, that's what they might need and they might have to have. So mm -hmm. there's definitely benefit for it. Not so much of a benefit for a public-facing social open sim grid with hypergrid and with lots of content and social events and things like that. And I have just two questions from OpenSim. We've got to be really quick about this because we're mm -hmm. already over. But oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, from the YouTube channel, um, Gwinnett Ryder Sinclair, how will OpenSim compete with Amazon Samarian? Do you have any ideas on that one? Uh, yeah, we can't compete with anything Amazon. Uh, <laughs> uh, Simple answer. Moving on. We, we have such a small audience uh, user base compared to anything else. We have such a small install base. Um, I mean, it's growing. The signs are positive, but it's growing in a linear pace, which is good. But it's not growing at an exponential pace, mm. which is what you would need for mass adoption. So people like it, and they bring other people in. At a kind of a steady, a steady growth rate, mm -hmm. and if everything else was standing still, that's fine. But everything else isn't standing still. We don't have Amazon's resources on anything. We don't have Google's resources or Apple's resources or Facebook's resources, and and we we probably never will. Uh, this, I mean, I was hoping maybe Google would look at OpenSim and because they like they adopted the Linux code base for Android, maybe they would yeah. do something like that. But they're building from scratch. They're building Cardboard and the Daydream platform, and uh, they're mostly going with Unity and Unreal and those kind of um, engines. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of hope there. Yeah. One last question, but we got to be even quicker. Okay. This is from YouTube. Um, Sally Devasani, uh, she wanted to just know your opinion on Android Viewer Lumina. Um, it's not really an immersive viewer. It's not something you would put on a headset and you're inside the world. Um, it's something to check in on, like if you're a merchant and you're selling things or you need to provide customer service or interact with people. Um, 
So um, I've I've used the the mobile viewers for OpenSim. Uh, I've I've even used a VR viewer for OpenSim on a mobile phone and got it got it to work. Oh. Um, but uh, the 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 slowness, lack of immersion, make makes it useful for certain specialized applications, but not a good fit for mass adoption. Gotcha. All right. Um, so, Maria, thank you so much for your presentation. The one thing I heard loud and clear was I'm going to go shopping on Kitely and try to buy myself some hair this <laughs> afternoon. Um, <laughs> what a happy. Are, are, you, are you saying my hair is on a date? <laughs> yeah, no, my. I'm going to buy myself, I'm saying. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. As a reminder to the audience, um, you can see what's coming up on our schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. And following this session, we have a session called 40 Virtual Cities Online. And that will start at 9.30. So stay tuned.